Revelation 6. Um, just so that you'll sort of understand where I come from um, on this. I come from Pine Bluff, Arkansas. So that makes me think different. Um, Revelation 6, in my humble opinion, the opening of the sixth seal matches uh, nearly perfectly um, the passage in Matthew 24 in verse, uh, let's see here, verse 29, immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened, the moon shall not give her light, and the stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Those things there in Matthew 24, 29, to me, match identical to Revelation 6 and the opening of the sixth seal. Now, uh, for those of you who know me, um, I grew up loving to study prophecy. I read books when I was uh, in my younger days, a teenager. I classified myself as a, just a typical uh, pre-tribulational, pre-millennial. That's, that's what I'd heard. That's what I was told. And that's what I believed. And I believed it because, number one, everybody else around me believed it. Number two, uh, it meant that I wouldn't, have to, I wouldn't have to get hurt by anything and just go to heaven. And you're looking at the guy that my mom will tell you that if a doctor comes at me with a needle, what I'll do. I um, doctor came at with me came at me with a needle one time, and she was holding on to me, and he came in, and I started throwing a fit, and I knocked that needle, and it squirted all over the walls. And the doctor let out a curse, <laughs> went and got another one. <laughs> huh? Chased me down the hall? Yeah. Oh, that must have been so embarrassing. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, so I, that's why I believe, you know, it, it just seemed good to believe that. And I, and I sat under a professor in Bible college, George, that was amillennial. And he believed that all of that is uh, a metaphor. The thousand years is not really a thousand years. It's just a long time. Satan is bound right now. And I'm going, doesn't seem like he's bound. Yeah, that's a very long chain. And so, uh, but, he, but he taught... He actually taught premillennialism better than I'd ever heard it. I mean, he taught the, it was the class on Revelation, and he taught it pretty fair. Uh, but when, when God laid it on my heart to study, I just, I felt led to just drop everything I'd learned, forget everything I've learned, toss it out, act like I don't know it, and instead of reading everybody's commentaries and books, just read the Bible. And in reading the Bible, I found out that I could not justify some of the beliefs that I held. I couldn't, I couldn't find them, first of all. I couldn't find them. And um, so I, I believe... If you try to put me into a category, don't, because I don't fit in anybody's category. I just believe the Bible. The reason why I'm saying that is I believe that there is a possibility that you and I will, if we are alive and remain at that day, we will see this event take place. And I think I can show you biblically why. Uh, part of it is in Hebrews. God said he is 
going to shake both the heavens and the earth. He's going to shake them both. And he's going to do that to see who's still standing when he does. And I believe that God will strengthen our feeble knees. And I believe that those who are truly saved will be standing when that day, just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, we will be standing when the falling away takes place. And I think Revelation 6 and this sixth seal has a lot to do with that. Let's read it again. Revelation 6, verse 12, And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. That's what Jesus said in, in uh, Matthew 24, 29, The sun shall be darkened. And the moon became as blood. <clears throat> That's what was said in Acts chapter 2, which was a prophecy of Joel chapter 2. So we have the sun darkened, the moon not giving her light or turning to blood. Um, the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Well, that also was mentioned in Revelation 12 because of the war that takes place between Michael, the dragon, and, and one-third of the angels uh, who are cast out of heaven. The stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Remember, I just mentioned um, what Peter preached on the day of Pentecost. What he preached on the day of Pentecost was that the sun was going to be dark and the moon was going to turn to blood and the stars of heaven were going to fall. And that was from Joel. And on the day of Pentecost, what did, what did they hear? A rushing mighty wind. And the mountain and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. And every mountain and island were moved out of their places and the kings of the earth the great men and the rich men and the chief captains, the mighty men and every bondman and every free man hid themselves in the dens and the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide, on, hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb, from the, for the great day of his wrath has come and who shall be able to stand? Now I want to say, I want to say something concerning the what if I just gave. What, what if you and I are still here on that day? Now that used to scare me a lot, and it still does. Do we not have a God? Do we not have a Savior? Do we not have a God who protected Noah and his family? A God who protected Lot when fiery things came falling down from the heavens? A God who protected Daniel from being eaten by lions? A God who protected Paul when a snake latched onto his arm and everybody thought he was going to die. A God who protected Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. A God who protected the entire city of Jerusalem. A God who protected uh, Israel when Gideon and just 300 men broke their pitchers and shone their lamps and said the sword of the Lord and, and of Gideon and thousands upon thousands of the armies of the enemies fled because they thought, oh my goodness, we're surrounded. We have a God that's the same God who knew how to save Noah, Lot, Daniel, Job. He knew how to save all those people. He still knows how to save people. He's doing it now. Amen? He's a, he's a Savior God is who he is. And so while we would look on this event and be very concerned, I believe God will put peace in our heart. And we'll call upon the name of the Lord and God will, God will keep us on that day. Um. Turn to Isaiah 34. <clears throat> and, and you might, yeah, you know, I'll, just, I'll just flip back to it. Isaiah 34, because Isaiah 34 mentions 
almost the same thing. And this goes to what I said at the very beginning of our study in the book of Revelation was that the book of Revelation seems to be an index of the rest of the Bible. In other words, the things contained in Revelation are not just isolated from the rest of the Bible. God is actually showing you how other scriptures and other prophecies fit into uh, this situation. So, Isaiah 34, verse 2. For the indignation of the Lord is upon all nations, and his fury upon all their armies. He hath utterly destroyed them. He hath delivered them to the slaughter. Their slain also shall be cast out, and their stink shall come up out of their carcasses, and the mountains shall be melted with their blood. And then he says, and this is almost verbatim, the sixth seal. And all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. He just said that in Revelation 6. You remember that, the sixth seal? Then he said, all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off the vine and as a falling fig from the fig tree. Look back up on the screen. Uh, here we have uh, the mountains and the rocks. Let's see here. Um, we have um, every island and mountain moved out of their places. We have back in 13, the stars of heaven fell into the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs when she is shaken up a mighty wind. We have those things. We have the... Um, Let's see here. Where is it? The verse 14, the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together. You go back to Isaiah 34, and that's what it says. The he the, all the hosts of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll. So you have all these things here in Isaiah 34 that match what's happening in Revelation 6. And if I, if I could just for a moment... Have you, there in, in, I'm in Jeremiah 34, that's why I can't see it. Isaiah 34. If I could have you look in Isaiah 34. Uh, it says in verse 7, the unicorn shall come down with them. Now, who believes in unicorns? I do. Um, huh? There was in real, in real history. Uh, you know how up here, up on uh, 55 Mastodon State Park, you remember that? Remember what it used to be back in the late 60s, early 70s? The hippies and their motorcycles used to use those two hills to drive their... Remember that, Mom? And they didn't know what they were driving on. The state, somebody got in there and started looking around, found a mastodon bone in there, and when they went, hold on a second! And then they found all kinds of them there, and so they stopped the people riding their motorcycles up and down the hills there. But that's Mastodon State Park. It's a, it's a species that we know existed. And they were, it's basically American elephants. Okay, natural, um, born American elephants. Uh, they're sort of like the woolly mammoth. They were humongous creatures. Long trunk, big tusks, big bones. They have some of the bones there. I've been in that museum. Well... At about the same time, there was a creature known as the Siberian unicorn. Elasmotherium sibericum was the name. And of course, it was in, they found it in Siberia. And it was this massive animal, uh, probably about as big as an elephant or possibly bigger, bigger, probably as big as one of those mastodons up there, one of those mammoths. Was it, 
Was it bigger than a mastodon? And it had this one large, huge horn that came out of the front of its head. And God, if you study the unicorn in the Bible, you'll see how God uses it. It is a very powerful animal. And if a unicorn was running in your direction, you would not just stand there and wait to pet it as it went by. Okay, nowadays, the version of unicorns are these pretty little white horses with rainbows and stars and sparklies and girls like them and they'll paint unicorns on their... I saw a t-shirt the other day that said, uh, instead of trying to be somebody else, be yourself. Unless you can be a unicorn, then be a unicorn. <laughs> okay, but it says here, in Isaiah 34, verse 7, the unicorn shall come down with them. and the Now, those unicorns are extinct. But here's what I believe. I believe in the spiritual realm, there are very powerful, vicious devils that are like unicorns. And the purpose of a horn on any animal is what? What's the purpose? Why do rams have horns, George? Authority. Authority. Get, out of my, get out of my territory or else. Wham. And that's the symbolism of a horn uh, in the Bible is if you don't do what I say, I'm going to force you to do what I say. And, uh, and my horn is an unstoppable thing. You cannot get around it. You cannot cheat this law. You're going to have to do what I say. And I believe that there are spiritual unicorns. And also, I'm not done here. Notice if we go on down to verse 11. We're told in the parable of the seed and the sower that the fowls of the air are representative of spirits or devils. When the fowls of the air come down and eat the word, the seed that was sown by the wayside, when Jesus gives the, the definition of that, he says the wicked one or Satan cometh down and taketh away the word that was sown. So here we have in verse 11, the cormorant and the bittern. A bittern is a tern. And these are usually by the seaside. Shall possess it. And the owl and the raven shall dwell in it. And I believe these are all spirits. Uh, owls are creatures of the night. Come on in. Uh, and they are, all of these are flesh eaters. Generally in the list of birds that God said was, un, you're not supposed to eat them, they're unclean. In almost every case, it's because they were flesh eaters. God allowed them to eat things like doves and things like that because they were, they ate seed. But the flesh eaters like eagles and owls and things like, they were not, they were unclean. They were not allowed to eat them. And these owls, they're birds of prey. They're looking for things to kill. And then it says, verse 12, they should call the nobles thereof to the kingdom, but none shall be there and all her princes shall be nothing. And thorns shall come up in their palaces, nettles and brambles in the fortresses thereof. And it shall be an habitation of dragons and a court for owls. Are there dragons? Do you believe in dragons? Yep. Absolutely do. The old word for reptiles, any kind of reptile, uh, whether it was a lizard or whatever, was a dragon. Even now... There's a species of dragon over in the uh, East Asian Island, or the sea, yeah, the Eastern Asian Islands called the Komodo dragon. And it still exists. And it's, very, it's a very fierce animal. Um, it can take down a large deer with just one bite. The bite itself, there's like a poison, a bacteria, something like that on their teeth. And if they just bite the animal, all they got to do is wait for it to pass out and die. 
and then they go and they go and eat it. They tear it apart. But the bottom line is, we know who the dragon is. The chief dragon is Satan. There are other spirits that are dragons as well, serpent-like creatures. And it's funny to me, in the Western culture, dragons are always seen as enemies to be killed. In Eastern culture, from India to uh, Cambodia, uh, the Philippines, China, Japan, uh, Vietnam, you name it, whatever Eastern nation is over there, Korea, dragons are good. They're good spirits. And they worship them still to this day. When they have their festivals, they have in this big dragon. They carry, you know, up and down in the parades and stuff like that. These are all spirits that possess, watch this now, that possess a place that, is, that used to be inhabited by men. The men have been taken away, and now these animals move in. And I've used this illustration before because, number one, devils are not afraid of us as humans per se. They're not. They come at us, especially if we're lost. They just come at us. The devils just have their way with human beings. What has to be present or who has to be present in our life for devils to be afraid, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Jesus Christ, he is the man. So you take this and you can apply it to any area of life. If you dismiss Jesus, the man, out of your life by being neglectful to prayer, being neglectful to your reading of God's word, being neglectful to Live the life that God has called us to live. As soon as you put Jesus out of your life, do these devils have anything to be afraid of anymore? No, they're going to move in. Just like you would see an old farmhouse somewhere that nobody lives in. When you go in that place, what are you going to find in there? Critters, snakes, skunks. Things that when they move, you go, <laughs> spiders, roaches. But when the man lives back in there again, they can't handle that because God put a fear of the man in those beasts. Isn't that something? Amen. Uh, let's see here. We already read Matthew 24, Mark 13. Uh, it pretty much says the same thing. So I want to I move on. Luke 21, there should be signs in the sun and the moon and in the stars upon the earth, distress of nations, perplexity and the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth. For the powers of heaven shall be shaken. There it is. And Luke 21 and Mark 13 are parallels to Matthew 24. So the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. What happens when God shakes heaven? All these angels start falling out of it like figs from a fig tree. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power. That's what we're looking for. Is Jesus coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads for your redemption draweth nigh. Some, that to me is the rapture. That's it. And he spake to them a parable. Behold the fig tree. What did he just give us in Revelation 6? A fig tree. Behold the fig tree and all the trees. So it's not just a fig tree. It's all the trees. When they now shoot forth, you see and know of your own selves that summer is now nigh at hand. So likewise, when you see these things come to pass, know that the kingdom of God is nigh at hand. Verily I say unto you, this generation shall not pass away till all be fulfilled. Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Underline that verse in your Bible. And if somebody ever asks you about your Bible, and 
I, you know, I believe all I believe all the translations have mistakes in them. You can open up to Luke twenty one thirty three and say, "Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away." It's exactly what I believe. Isaiah thirteen. Boy, there's a lot there, on there. Let's get started on Isaiah thirteen. There's a lot of meat on this chicken bone. Jared's preaching right along with me, aren't you, Jared? Yes, sir. Jer uh, Isaiah 13, start in verse 6. How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand, it shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. When you read those seal judgments, there's a lot of massive destruction there. Um... Then he says, verse 7, Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt. And what is that? That is people realizing something's happening that has never happened before on the face of the earth. And we were very, very afraid. They're going to melt men's hearts, failing them for fear. And they shall be afraid, verse 8. And then look at this. Pangs and sorrow shall take hold of them. They shall be as a woman that travaileth. Where else have you seen that in the Bible? A woman that travaileth? 1 Thessalonians 5. For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Um, when Lisa was um, about to give birth to Lindsay, our first, she was sitting just, I think, the next seat above where D is, and I could see, I could tell she was having contractions. But it took a long time. It took like all night into the next day for that to happen. With Alicia, she's the one that caught us all by surprise. We were just sitting there watching, I think it was Roseanne. And all of a sudden, Lisa jumped up. Oh! And ran to the bathroom, and I went, this is it. And I'm running around the house grabbing stuff like the Keystone Cops. And then we're driving down Highway 30. You know how they had those little stoplights there? I ran every one of them. Lisa said, what are you doing? I said, what I'm doing is not having a baby in the car. That's what I'm doing. Uh, you don't know when a woman is going to go and travail, typically. The, you, and back in the old days, right? You don't know. And that's how... It's going to hit. And there are always people who say, I'll wait. I'll wait. Aren't you glad you didn't wait? No matter who's, whose funeral I preach, if I know that they've been a saint for a long time, Sister Bernice passed away, same thing. Wayne passed away, same thing. I'll say, I'll try to find out when they got saved. 25 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, 50 years ago. And I'll say in their funeral, you know what? They got saved 40 years ago. Now that may seem like a long time and that he could, have, he could have waited 38 years or 39 years and partied every day up until then. But did he know? Did she know? No. But she got saved 40 years ago because she knew this day was coming. Didn't know when, but knew that it was coming. And living a life for the Lord for 40 years, 50 years, 20 years, 5 years, or a year is never wasted time. Okay? 
even Danny, who did wait till close to the end. But you know what? I was at his house. Danny, where are you going when you die? Going to heaven, Mike. He knew. And it was a life well spent. Always is. Always is. Uh, let's see here. It shall, uh, verse 8 again. Verse 9. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel, both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof, thereof out of it. So, notice that he said in verse 9, the, Lord, the day of the Lord cometh both with wrath and fierce anger. After, in 1 Thessalonians 5, after it says, that day shall come uh, um, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. It later on says about us being children of the day, for God has not appointed us unto wrath. So I believe that at this time of travail, God is going to deliver us up, caught up, to be with the Lord, to do one thing here, to destroy the sinners out of the land. What did God do with Sodom and Gomorrah and Adma and Zebulun, I think is what it was? Did he get rid of all the sinners? Did he miss anybody? Did he make a mistake and leave some Christians in there? Nope. He's not going to make any mistakes, people. Rest assured, God always knows where you are. God always knows how, when he's going to come and get you. You don't have to worry about it. God's going to do it. Amen? God's going to do it. It's like, why do they put you, why do you think they put you to sleep before you have surgery? Well, it'll hurt, number one. Number two, you're not supposed to tell the doctor how you want him to do the surgery. Right? Like, okay, anyway. So they put you to sleep so you don't get in the way. Father, we love you. We thank you, Lord, for this book. There's a lot of things, Lord, here that I don't understand. There's some things I think I understand. Lord, there very could well be some things that I'm, I'm just completely wrong about. But Father, I know your word. And I know it's never wrong. You're never wrong. You never lie. You never hide the truth from us. It's right here in black and white. Lord, give us a heart, a desire to read it, to know it, to trust it, to be in fellowship with those also who believe it and trust it, Lord, and to shun people, Lord, who would scoff and laugh at this precious, precious book. Help us to share it, Lord, with as many as who will hear it and warn them, just like we would warn somebody if they were going to go swimming in a pond somewhere, that that pond's full of snakes. You shouldn't go in there. Lord, help us to care about people that much to warn them that they shouldn't live for the devil anymore. They should live for you because there's danger coming. Lord, put that in our hearts. I ask this, Father, in Jesus' name, and all of God's people said, Amen.